What's going on guys, Skit Gaming here, and today we find ourselves in the month of October, also known as Spooky Season. I've compiled a list of 13 horror games through polling, recommendations, and personal experience, and I'm gonna give them all a brief review. Keep in mind that these are in no particular order, and I didn't get to look at all the games that were recommended, so if you feel the list is incomplete, you can let me know down in the comments. We've got a lot to get through, so let's hop right into it. We're starting off strong with a very highly regarded and requested game, Doors. In Doors, your mission is to traverse a hundred rooms in a mysterious hotel. You're not the only one there, though. Various hostile entities populate the areas and pose a serious risk to your survival. Each one has a unique appearance and mechanics, so you need to employ different tactics depending on the encounter. The gameplay loop is very reminiscent of Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, where a series of randomly selected rooms and monsters is punctuated by guaranteed events at certain points. A room might be nothing but a short, unobstructed hallway that doesn't even slow you down, or a darkened maze of chambers and debris that you need to hunt through for the key to move on. Overall, I think this is a top tier Roblox game. The models all seem custom made, the animations are seamless, the sound design is without equal, and the scripted events are incredibly smooth. I mean, look at this chase sequence. Every feature is great on its own, and they combine to achieve a quality rarely seen in Roblox games. I love how each monster has its own gimmick, and they're all pretty easy to learn. If you die, the game will even tell you what you did wrong. My personally least favorite entity is Screech, but I call him the Ankle Goblin. His design is so uncanny, and the way his mechanics work makes sure he freaks me out even if I am quick enough to catch him in time. And he's like, the least dangerous recurring entity. All of the others, with the exception of a literal spider named Timothy, will kill you way quicker. It goes to show the effort that the devs put in to make the atmosphere complement the gameplay so well that what basically amounts to a nuisance is absolutely terrifying to me. Now, Doors has a problem that quite a few games on this list share, and that's high difficulty that could lead to a lot of frustration. You can generally figure out what you did wrong after dying a few times and easily make it past rooms, but when I fail that stupid wardrobe QTE for the hundredth time and get booted all the way back to the beginning again, you can see how my mood could be negatively affected. The game does incentivize you to play co-op with your friends, which can greatly enhance the chances of somebody making it to the end. Alright, hey, if you find a bandage, I need it. I don't know, man. I'm on, like, I died. <laughs> what do you mean you died? What? <laughs> what? I died <laughs> three. <laughs> I gotta do a little toe gobble. <laughs> but it also hurts your individual life expectancy because they hog all the wardrobes when you need to hide. Woo wee! Flicker. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> 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 Dude, I got a oh, lighter, don't mind if I do. Doors also has a bunch of badges that manifest in-game as these cute little achievements, which I greatly enjoy. Overall, I'd say that Doors is an excellent game. I'm not the first to make that claim, and I probably won't be the last. 9 out of 10. Alone in a Dark House is an old co-op horror game where you play as a detective investigating the home of the recently deceased Smith family. As you unlock more rooms and progress through the house, you learn more and more about the family's backstory and the origins of the monster that's stalking you. The dark, terrifying... Eric. Yes, the evil demon spirit thing is just a guy from Arkansas called Eric. Before I go on, I need to rip on this guy just a little bit more. I've always held the view that the shadowy, humanoid figure with glowing eyes is the blandest, most unimaginative character design in the whole genre. Ooh, look! A black guy that stares at you, that's so spooky! Anyway, Alone in a Dark House incorporates a few puzzles and easter eggs that give it a leg up on the competition. If you put all the cups in the sink, you unlock a maid outfit. If you play a secret tune on the PNG piano, you get a cool badge. Little things like that go a long way to winning me over. True to its name, the house is very dark. That is, unless you have the Spec Op skin equipped that comes with nods. The entire investigation comes to a head when you confront the creature outside to learn the truth and engage in a final battle that decides if you're ever going to leave the house alive. I have played this game in the past. Ah! And I kid you not, when I logged back on to get this footage, I was absolutely convinced I had stumbled into some parody of the actual game. Oh, uh, here we are. Alright, who wants, who wants baby bottle coke? Here, here, Zach, you look thirsty, you look thirsty. I don't I want, want baby want bottle coke. Mmm, yum. No, mm, I don't so want tasty. it. Shut up. 
Have your cocaine. Yummy, yummy. They added a prologue tutorial, did away with the cool lobby, and for some inexplicable reason, there's a portal at the beginning labeled Combat Ops that'll teleport you to a totally unrelated Afghanistan game made by the same guy. That kinda kills the mood. The game itself is different too. It turned into Weenie Hut Jr. mode with live messages telling you exactly what to do, and only one parkour segment that results in instantaneous death. Eric doesn't even randomly attack you anymore, which is the only thing that created suspense in the first place. Oh, is he, is he thirsty? Mm, mm. Oh yeah. The only good change that's occurred is that instead of using some otherworldly spectral force to hurt you, Eric now just does Kung Fu. That being said, Alone in a Dark House isn't the bottom of the barrel. It's still got some great features. You're able to use right click to carry comically large objects, and you can even use them as a magic carpet to traverse the area. Also, you're encouraged to steal money from the owners of the house at every chance you get, which I think is just hilarious. All in all, not the worst horror game. Alone in a Dark House gets a 6 out of 10. The Mimic is one of those games that's gotten so much popularity and reached so many mainstream audiences that most Roblox gamers have heard of it even if they aren't interested in the genre. The levels come with a sort of guaranteed quality that makes this game a popular destination for YouTubers as well. The Mimic is a series of stories that has you and your friends braving supernatural figures from Japanese myths and urban legends, as well as playing through seasonal game modes with a variety of themes. The mainline chapters usually come in layers, like a fancy cake, where there's exploration sections punctuated by puzzles and chase scenes. Like I said before, the quality of these chapters, especially later on in the game's lifetime, make the mimic stand head and shoulders above most other horror games on the platform. The settings can be massive and majestic, but still linear and simple to traverse. The monsters and jump scares are very well done, and they even have custom voice acting. There's more to this game than I could fit into one paragraph, so I'm just going to give it my blessing and let you and your friends figure out the rest on your own. A true staple, the Mimic has earned itself a 9 out of 10. Roses is a horror game that was born in 2017 and died in 2019. It's a spooky single player experience set in an abandoned mental hospital, where you're looking for a close friend who had disappeared while filming there. I'm gonna level with you. The only reason this game is on the list is if I didn't put it here, the 25 Robux I spent on it would have been entirely wasted. Don't buy this game, it's not even scary. If anything, it manages to be relaxing and comforting with warm, well-lit areas and soft piano music in the background. The description promises 25 minutes of gameplay, I searched every nook and cranny, and my total playtime came out to 11 minutes. Roses could have been so much more, but now it's been resigned to a mere 2 out of 10. Recovery proves that you don't need a good story or even surprise jump scares to be scary. All you need is the fear of losing all of your progress. Again. Recovery takes place deep underground in a recently abandoned mineshaft, where you and your partners find yourselves up against otherworldly shadow creatures with a taste for miners. Navigate the three levels of the map, collect the items to open up new areas, and repair the elevator to escape the clutches of the mines. Recovery sports three types of enemies with different behaviors that begin to harass you as you progress through the game. They aren't very distinct from a distance, so you have to rely on the audio cues to identify them. This game runs into two problems that I see a lot in the genre. Firstly, the horror elements are quickly overshadowed by the gameplay loop. It loses the spooky factor because of how easy it is to die and how the objectives are defined. After the dozenth death, the monsters are just nuisances that prevent you from filling up the generator or getting the bolt cutters. The other problem is that it's way too difficult. Keeping player frustration to a minimum should be the goal in any game, and yet when I played this for a video last year, it took Steam and I about two hours of dying over and over to give up. The ending of the game wasn't deemed important enough to sink more time into playing, and that is a travesty. Spooky for the first couple of lives, 4 out of 10. Before the Truth is a first-person horror game made by the same people who did The Asylum. It takes that general gameplay loop and compresses it down to a smaller, more palatable package. You'll still be looking for keys, solving puzzles, and exploring the map, but now there's a lot less pointless running involved. I get the general feel of a Gmod horror map, kind of a laid-back type of game, you know? There's no rush, no suffocating atmosphere, but you still get hit with scares every now and again. I played it with Onyx, and we all had a good time trying to figure out codes and unlock doors. Oh, they also carried over two of my ironically favorite features from the Asylum. The first being the hilarious voice acting. I do enjoy when games have custom voice lines, but like, you can call me, you know, I could do a voice for you if you really need somebody. It's just that I can't listen to this guy recount a horrifying double homicide and keep a straight face. What can 
as a detective is not easy. Let's see what we've got today. In the same vein, this game has kept a silence tradition of having documents that contain tragic stories, but then slap a photo of a Roblox character right next to them. At least they didn't try and pull that stupid twist where they say the monster was just misunderstood even though it abducted you. The scariest part is the driving in the intro, 7 out of 10. The Mirror is a short and sweet interactive experience that explores every player's fear of going insane and becoming a furry. It doesn't take skill to play, it doesn't last that long, and it doesn't have a happy ending. That being said, I do like what is there, and I'm sure some of you will too. Still more content than Roses, 5 out of 10. Identity Fraud is a true classic. The best word to describe it is based. It starts with you, the player, refusing to take your prescribed medicine and schizomaxing in the doctor's office. Based. You then make your way through three separate mazes, each with their own unique threats. The main one in the first level is Fraud, who kills women and wears her skin like a suit. Based. Once you're out of there, you enter the hedge maze, which is absurdly easy, just follow the lights and don't look at the pretty firefly. Finally, you've got the school type level with a very aggressive hall monitor. Also easy, just listen for the beeps. Beeps? What could that mean? Oh yeah, that's Morse code, baby. So relax, relax and, and take, take notes. notes! Then speak the magic word to access the final hallway. What's this? There's another encoded door to unlock the exit? Good thing you got your Morse decoder ready. Oh, wait! The game arbitrarily switched it up to keep you on your toes. Based. Now pull up a hex translator, we don't have all day. Finally, the enormous doors creak open, and what are you greeted with? A boss fight with a huge red guy who will instantly massacre you with his Iron Man chest beam. Based. And the game gives you a rocket launcher to take him out. Once he's dead and you beat the game, how do you think the Chad identity fraud sends you off? Booted. Get out of here, scrub. Game's over. What were you expecting? A conclusion paragraph? Get lost. Overall, Identity Fraud is a simple game with a simple mission. You know what you're getting into, and it doesn't pretend to be something it's not. Which is ironic, considering the game's title. I will say that it could benefit from some background music or other ambient noise. The general silence can get boring after a while. Also, it is your masculine duty to pretend to be fraud and terrorize every player you run into. Easy 9 out of 10. The Haunted Staircase is something of a tech demo made by the same guy who did Recovery. It's based on the entity described in the document SCP-087, The Stairwell. If you've read the logs from that file, you can accurately predict the events of this game. Like I said earlier, the creator labels it more as a demo than an actual game, so there's not much content to be had. As a side note, while I was researching this to confirm that the stairs actually twist the other direction, I examined the only image we have of the location, which of course contains the face of whatever intercepts test subjects. However, when I came back to the page to save the image, there's no longer a face in it. It's definitely supposed to be there, I just don't know where it went, so that's cool. Anyway, I'll give the Haunted Staircase a 4 out of 10. I don't know how this game ended up on my list, I had never heard of it and I can't find any comments on the community post about it. In any case, Faith is a game set in a world devastated by a mysterious disease that's capable of turning people into hideous monsters, Resident Evil style. You and your buddy James are searching a quarantined island in order to learn about the origins of the virus and maybe even find a cure. In your quest for knowledge, you encounter humans and monsters alike as you work your way through the abandoned buildings. I have a lot to say about this game. First of all, it actually has an acceptable amount of content. There's only one chapter right now and it's still longer than most similar games on Roblox. It's got puzzles and mazes alongside your standard exploring and door unlocking experience. Most of the models are meshes that look great, if a little oversized. They even have a badges page in the main menu where you can see what achievements you got like indoors. All that being said, there are a number of problems that plague this game. First off, it's way too dark. I don't mean like, tone dark, I mean like, literal dark, like actually, I can't see anything. The first two thirds of chapter one are set in pitch blackness that you can only combat with your flashlight which runs on the world's crappiest batteries. It's so dark at times that you can't even see the monsters, which makes the game less scary and more annoying at the same time. Speaking of annoying, anytime you sprint you have this big white rectangle that appears around your camera and your vision blurs after the first second of running. For a guy set on saving the world, your character sure wasn't prepared for light cardio. The gameplay starts off on the slower side, but that changes once you get spawn camped for a half hour by the stupid burnt marshmallow man. 
everything after that occurs at a decent pace. The inventory is pointless, considering the fact that you can neither select items nor see what they are. Finally, the story is a bit weak, like the overarching plot of the disease kind of stays in the background, and the dialogue doesn't make sense a lot of the time. As for some things I liked, your companion James is played by an actually decent voice actor, which is extraordinarily rare on this platform. The game also makes liberal use of cutscenes, which aren't entirely necessary, but it reflects a lot of effort on the developer's part. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised by the effort put into Faith. I'd rate it a 7 out of 10. Rust Machine. Most who've played it have forgotten it, and everyone else wishes they were in the same boat. In this game, you have to escape an old mansion by doing puzzles and defeating the final boss. The rooms are laden with various deadly traps, and one wrong move could mean the end of your run. I'm gonna be honest, I do not much enjoy this game. I tried to make a video on it a few years ago, and I gave up because it was too difficult. Either they updated it to make it easier, or I was just terrible at games back then. Because now me and some Onyx boys beat it in three or four tries. What is this? Oh wait, it's like an Iron OSD. Maiden, and a, and a skeleton with the key came out. Oh, All right. I think Louise! <laughs> wait. <laughs> Louise! Is it James? Oh my god, what did you do? Why did you do that? Rust Machine hasn't been updated in over a year, and it's beginning to show its age. There seem to be some missing audio assets, and the lighting is just awful if your graphics are turned up. I will say that the puzzles are nice and simple, and the randomly generated traps keep you on edge. The final boss fight is... unconventional. You basically kite a killing floor enemy while doing a bunch of math problems before the time runs out. I don't have much more to say about this game. Give it a play if it sounds interesting to you, but I'm probably never going to touch it again. 5 out of 10. The Rake is an endless survival horror loop based on the famous creepypasta of the same name. Your goal is to survive for 8 minutes in the dark, snowy woods while the Rake stalks you. There are a number of map locations you can hole up in, like the watchtower and the safe house, as well as the power station that will inevitably zap your toes when you try and turn the lights back on. When dawn breaks, the rake will retreat to his cave and you're free to trade with the merchant from Resident Evil 4 for helpful tools. This game's a lot harder than I remember, and while trying to get footage, we found out that the rake tends to just spawn on top of you out of nowhere, which is a really uncool way to run a survival game. What is well, that? Is that night vision or something? Yeah, it's night vision. Oh, he just spawned on you, what the heck? The flashlights could be improved on as well, seeing as how totally black your surroundings are. I don't know if they're still there, but there used to be a bunch of items that you could get from airdrops that basically allow you to bully the rake the entire night. Like, a circle of people just beating him with batons, essentially. Terrible spawns aside, I'd give the rake a 7 out of 10. Last but not least on this year's list, 3008 is a survival horror game set inside of SCP-3008-1, a seemingly endless IKEA furniture store crawling with mindless humanoid monsters who don't take kindly to outsiders. During the artificial daytime, players are free to roam the store, collecting food, medical supplies, and building materials to shore up their defenses. After a few minutes though, the lights will go out and the staff become hostile and ravenous. During the nighttime, anyone who doesn't find shelter and hunker down is subject to dismemberment, as instances of 3008-2 flood through the aisles in search of blood. OH GOD HE'S UP HERE! <laughs> the game leans more into the sandbox building aspect than the horror, but I think it still pulls off a spooky vibe when you're cowering behind a futon to avoid a 7 foot tall monster with no face. Plus, it's one of the few games that you guys recommended in the poll that wasn't doors. I do wish you were able to fight back against the staff like in the actual SCP document, but it is what it is. 3008 has a certain charm with the iconic pleasant daytime music and the little easter egg items, which is something I can appreciate. I'll rate it an 8 out of 10. And that's that. The 2022 Horror Game Skit Mega Review has come to a close. There are quite a few honorable mentions that I'll put on screen now. I either didn't have time to look at these, or I deemed them unfit to be on the list. Some of them seem really good, but I kind of ran out of time with schoolwork and stuff. So my apologies if your favorite game is there and it's not in the review, comment down below. Thanks for watching, have a safe Halloween, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.